We're live. Episode two. What's up? Season two. <laughs> What's going on, guys? Welcome to the man cave. Yeah, we got All a right. special guest, my brother from G. I, I was thinking about it the other night. It's like th over 30 years now. Yeah, dude. What the hell? What is going on? <laughs> Currently the Doro drummer. Are you still doing the NXS thing? I guess not. No, I um I took a hiatus from that and basically now with all this other shit going on, I mean the two the commute would be Yeah, impossible. Ridiculous. But uh yeah, things sort of went in a different direction for me and my priority is here now, so Yep. Yeah, but it's good. I mean I should have moved ages ago but uh yeah so you're in germany now right i am yeah right on how long have you lived there um just over a year about a year and a half that's cool yeah officially i mean i spent the last 27 years coming here and living for like temporary uh, amounts of time maybe like a summer in an apartment while we were doing festivals and stuff like that, but uh, never actually. I'm I'm a, a official resident now. I just got my German driver's license the other day, and you know, still working on the language uh, <laughs> issue, which is man a real bitch. But uh, yeah, it's nowhere you know. near. They're nowhere close to speaking Italian. No, dude, Italian <laughs> just kind of flows off the tongue, you know, if you know what you're, Spanish, what you're doing. But. When somebody speaks Spanish, if you know enough Italian, you can kind of get away with what they're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, I mean, anything, you know. But German? German. Yeah, it's a whole... <laughs> I'm lost. Yeah, it's, it's difficult, man. And I was never a language guy either. I mean, I never studied any any languages in school or, you know, that good american education that just yeah. kind of like went <laughs> yeah. i was checking out uh your facebook and all the pictures you're putting up like with your family out around germany wow it, looks, it just looks awesome there man it's um you know i'm still sort of it's weird when you're on tour you know you see I've seen cities numerous times. I always tell this story that I was in Paris three times before I actually saw the Eiffel Tower. So it's <laughs> like when you're touring and you're just in and out, it's really hard to, to catch anything worthwhile. Right. You know, if you're lucky, you might see something. But for me, coming to Germany and now all those times, I always would try to catch something on the day off or whatever. But now that I'm actually here, and I can do like a day trip or a weekend thing and having a little dude now, you know, you want to show him around and, and keep him, you know, keep him busy because he starts to melt down if he's in the house too long. So we've been doing these little trips, but yeah, Germany's beautiful, man. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of really amazing stuff to see that I haven't even seen yet. I have a huge list of stuff. So I've been just kind of going whenever I'm close to something. I try to get, you know, get there, but, um, you know, there's also places that are kind of out of the way and there's not a whole lot going on. The city I live in at Fulda, which is, you know, really nice, but it's very small and there's not a whole lot of a scene here or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. kind of a, a very religious Catholic type town. So a lot of people come here and they visit the dome, the church, the cathedral and do you know whatever these um types of trips do but um yeah it's something that i'm really into and especially because i you know like to take photos so if there's the subject matter is really cool it's like even better dude i was totally digging the photos like i said i was looking on there it's like wow i would love to go there sometime yeah man Very i wish cool. more people could get over here you know a lot of friends and family my sister just came over uh, last year before Christmas, and uh, it was so nice to have her here. She'd never been here before, and um, yeah, it's definitely some place to visit. That's probably not on the first, you know, on people's first sort of uh, checkpoint on their lists or whatever. But it's uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah, right on. Now, are are you guys? 
able to play at all now? Anything going on over there? Or? Yeah, not a whole lot because as we know, things are changing every day, everywhere, you know, depending on what, yeah. what the particular statistics are and whatever. So we, um, you know, Germany, I guess, handled the whole thing a little bit quicker and better than some other places. So they kept a, a decent lid on it, but uh, they also had some spikes happening. But uh, as far as when things began to open up again, um, uh, they basically would allow certain types of shows, which was some drive-in shows that we did. We did three. Um, and um, they were all sort of different. We The first one we did was, was very early on, so there was only cars allowed, and they were very you know, distanced and they also didn't allow people to really get out of the car and do anything to that effect. But uh, people were hanging out their windows and, and going for it. But it's, you know, it's a strange thing to not, you know, play to, I mean, some of the gigs we do are upwards of 20 to 90,000 people in the summer. So it's like to have like, you know, a couple hundred cars sitting there. It's got to be weird. Yeah, it was just like cr crickets and, uh, you know, headlights flashing. It. Everybody, yeah, I was going to say they flash the headlights at you. And yeah, <laughs> and it's even weird because of the, you know, um, like the permission to do a show like that within the city limits. You know, you can't have a big scream and PA system. Uh, so they were transmitting the sound through the r speakers of the car, you know, FM broadcast. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so you're not getting the full effect. But, you know, for people who are hard up for a show and for us to just want to get out there and see what was possible, it actually was pretty, pretty that's, cool, you know. It's pretty cool. I mean, if nothing else, years from now, you can look back and say, we did that, man. That was, yeah. That was I mean, a weird definitely. time one of the first bands to do it especially you know not only here but anywhere and uh they progressively got a little bit better as we went on to the third one they had allowed some seating up front spaced out and the next show we're doing is basically no cars just going to be these um they call them a strand corb which is a beach chair but it's kind of an enclosed wicker type thing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're going to have those spaced out all along the, the infield and a typical festival stage. And, um, yeah, so we'll see how that goes. That's actually next weekend. And then uh, so, you know, promoters are trying anything they can to just to, to make up for some of the losses and uh, to see what's what can work, what's permissible, you know, under regulations and, and laws and stuff like that, because there's so much to be, you know, at least you guys like, are trying something. I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know if they're doing anything here. Are they George? I don't hear of anything. No, they're just, they're denying everything now and letting right. people just get sick. Yeah. That's what they're doing. I think they, uh, I, I mean, I heard of live nation wanting to do some driving stuff, but I haven't actually seen any, any foot i mean some people have even tried just okay boom straight out into a typical normal show you know and then that's going to get like clipped pretty quickly so yeah. i think the best way to do it is to just to you know be patient even though everybody's just way past it just to to do it you know a little bit longer and try to get to that get across that big hump and then hopefully we can see the other side and start doing it yeah. For real again. That it, it's not it, going to happen here for a long time, man. Mm, yeah. We can't it, even leave. I mean, it's getting to the point now where, you know, you go across state lines, they even want to quarantine you. Or, yeah. yeah. Well, they'll pull yeah. you over. That, yeah. It's crazy, man. But, yeah. you know, they're not, they gave up on everything. So, yeah. Well, there, our November tour just got, pushed back so um you know everything we had this year is pretty much wiped out so you know now we're into 2021 anyway so it's like you know we're pretty much the same boat here nobody's gonna try to do an, a real show until you know 
to yeah. get a real grip on this thing. I'm surprised they're trying to do the NFL, man. Mm. Yeah. Van says that. they're doing some local shows in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess um, luckily in the summer you can do, you know, if it's outside, you've got a little bit more of a chance of, you know, uh, following some distancing rules, you know. But once you get into a smaller venue or something like that, that's going to be real tough to yeah. to make it happen or make it even fun, you know, for yeah. anybody. <laughs> but, you know. Um, Outside yeah. Chicago in the winter might be a little rough to play. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> What's with the NFL then? Are they going to do it without fans in the Right stadium? now it's posted yeah. without fans, but – Kind of like the Bundesliga here and all the the soccer. Yeah, uh, but the, I mean the way things are going here, they got to put them in like the NBA, put them in some kind of bubble. Right. Baseball didn't do it, and now you know they're constantly somebody's popping positive, and they got to cancel games. And yeah, they had to cancel the whole Philly series here after the first weekend because yeah. I think <laughs> yeah, I did did hear that. That sucked, man. Yeah. Eight of the Marlins had. You know, yeah, they were just spreading went, it to everyone, man. He went to a strip bar the, like a couple nights before and then gave it to everybody else. <laughs> oh, my God. At least they're yeah. trying. I mean, I'm happy just to be able to have something to watch, man, besides yeah. you know, some game from 1995. You know? mm. So that's something different. Yeah, it's definitely different. So now it's Doro recording now that you guys are kind of down, you guys doing anything or um, as a band, we're just doing these shows. Um, everybody's doing, you know, what pretty much everyone else is doing is working in their own little bubbles, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but Doro did uh, one single during this lockdown uh, phase. She went to Hamburg and worked with her producer and put out this new song, Brick Wall, which is the latest thing. But as far as a record, she'll mm -hmm. keep working. I mean, it's doesn't really phase her because the way she makes a record is very, um, not haphazardly, but just like um, she'll, you know, she might work on instead of getting together like a typical typical situation where you you know are a band to do pre production, pick ten songs and go in the studio and make a record, or even you know record remotely. But knowing more of what's going to happen, she kind of goes with the flow. If she has an idea, she'll go and get it down or co write with her producer or something like that, and just. Like this song, Brick Wall, that kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, I didn't even know it was happening, but um, sometimes that's the way it is for her. And I'm sure during this period, that's probably what's going to stay. Um, but if we typically are together in the summertime for festivals, uh, we usually go in the studio and we'll lay down some tracks while the band is all here. Because we had, you know, um, it used to be, two Americans, me and Nick flying over all the time. Nick Douglas on bass would, you know, travel back and forth. So if we were here for like a length of time, three, four weeks, and there was breaks in between shows, we would go in the studio and work on some of the new songs. Like that's how we did the last album. And um, yeah, but this time everything's, you know, all bets are off for the yeah. normal <laughs> ways. So Man, it's crazy how many bands are like that now, man, where they're just, they're not spread out across a country. They're spread out across the world anymore. It seems like you got members everywhere. Yeah, it can now, be pretty, um, pretty spread out for sure. Yeah. Now that everything's digital, man. If You know, it's, yeah. There's guys recording now. I was reading over Zoom. Yeah. I mean, you can, records, man. it's, uh, I mean, that's, that, uh, I don't know how that's those going. possibilities have been there for a while, you know, and they've been growing every year because, you know, I mean, you can work, make more records that way. You know, some of these dudes have like five, six bands projects that they're doing and they're just blowing them out in their house while they're off the road, you know? So it's, it's pretty cool. But now that this uh, COVID thing is happening, it's like on overdrive, you know, people are just doing you know, jams from their home with the whole band 
all in different places and you could also record a whole record it's crazy that way too and you know the early early on in the pandemic guys were like the band uh like the super suckers uh guys in that band did a single called shit's fucked or something like that (laughs) and even the production on that thing was like for as early as it was was pretty good Hmm. now it seems like more and more as i guess zoom or whatever is advancing everything's getting a little more solid sound and you know some Mm. sound as raw well you know i think you can get the good thing about it is that it's you know the 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 possibilities to you know i mean some of the studios people have in their homes are so advanced and if everybody's recording into something serious, you know, when you just put it all together, you know, I would think the the audio is all kind of going to be top quality. You know, the video from Zoom or whatever it might be is is going to be okay. But I mean, technically, the sound should be as good as any other recording. You know, when you get it as the end result. I have a question for you. I mean, you've been a working musician for a long time. I know this question. Uh, <laughs> I know the worms. How what old you, am I? I no. <laughs> it has to do with can I can I just say what it is? Go ahead. Without <laughs> without asking the question, <laughs> it's the it's uh, the difference between recording all uh, analog and digital. analog to digital. What uh, what fucking hates digital drums? I, I'm not a big digital guy, man. Mm. At all. You can tell. I can't tell. <laughs> I mean, some I can. Some of the like testament and stuff like that, I can tell. But it yeah. just seems to me like everybody is using the same program anymore, right? And especially the metal guys, they all start sounding the same to me. Oh um, yeah, I mean, you know? they're, well, it's so different from the way that it used to be. You know, to record the two inch tape or you know, and the process back then. Um, but now I think what you're hearing is not really because if you listen, go back and listen to early digital, um, like when CDs first came out, shit sounded pretty amazing still. You know, if anything, it was more there was more clarity, maybe lost some balls, you know what I mean? And some some depth and stuff. But I mean, the clarity and the the sounds were still there, but then as we got more into the, um, you know, the sampling of drums or, you know, reamping guitars and things like that and how the sound of music, sound of metal bands has progressed. I mean, um, now it's like, just for an example to, for a bass drum, right? Something that's very, huge normally huge boomy instrument that's carrying a lot of low end um for something like that to cut through these tuned down guitars and tuned down basses or seven strings and all i mean this like it's taken up the whole spectrum of the bottom of the bass you know so all of a sudden you're taking this kick drum and you're fucking you're gonna have to put it somewhere else in the Mm -hmm. you know, in your spectrum of sound. So you all of a sudden take all the bottom end out and you just have a click, you know, so you're fitting this click almost above the bass guitar and the guitars. And it's just come kind of changing the whole sonic uh, spectrum. So it's like now you're, you're a guy that obviously loves vinyl and loves older recordings and older bands and all those old sounds so for me also it's hard it's a hard audible adjustment like my ears Mm -hmm. don't really accept a lot of the newer stuff you know and especially when drums you know the easiest way to make a a, there's also a budget thing like uh, making a record these days when you don't have much of a budget there is you know uh techniques you can use to basically get a killer drum sound without really having to go spend, you know, a grand a day in a studio or more than that. And, um, you know, so like you said, a lot of people are using the same sounds, same techniques to get, you know, 
really flat dead drums that were recorded in a in a basement for example to sound like a real record they have a have to add a lot on top of that so that's probably what you're hearing and what you're not really digging but um, some of it is just like with the new especially the newer digital it's just nuts man it's like what's up, man? oh man <laughs> he's like six doing? feet tall now <laughs> <laughs> holy crap that's awesome man <laughs> he just got home from work Making cool good to see you buddy Nice yeah. to see you, man. How you been? Yeah, I'm good. That's Getting good. old. <laughs> What's going on, Greeno? Not much, man. How you doing? Uh, another day, another dollar. That's all it is, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but like with uh, especially like the last 10, 15 years, like with with CDs, the digital music is just like so in your face. Like a friend and I talk about it, where there's like no air no space in the music anymore it's just like right. as soon as it starts playing you know through your stereo yeah. it's hitting you in the face until the next track and it's hitting right. you in the face till the next track yeah like, go back and listen to these old albums man you know it's there's something in between there you can hear everything oh, and there was yeah. an art to it you know like yeah acdc put out this album it was great the next albums uh, it was okay and it wasn't just the songwriting. It just it sounded kind of different. Then the next album came out. I was like, ah, oh, this one's great again. You know, yeah. they're doing different stuff, different places, you know. And yeah. it's like, I don't know. I miss that. I mean, and, and I understand it's, you know, especially for like, you know, uh, newer band or bands today trying to put out new stuff like Kicks. You know, what, four or five years ago, put out that new album. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was all done at, at the, uh, the new bass player's place you know what i mean which is cool right. we got a new yeah. album out of it but yeah. it's like you know i don't know just missing something yeah well, <laughs> right. you know it's uh, hard to hard to um compare you know something that may have cost about you know 15 20k to something that was you know records when i started making them were you know i mean the first britney album uh our budget was 80 grand wow. and that was a that was a low low Ball, yeah. you know right people, you know second one was like 200 or something like that and you know people were spending so much money which probably never got recouped anyway but now you know to make a like i said to make a a good sounding record with very little you know people are putting so much money into their gear mm -hmm. you know that uh it's hard to replace or re you know that was one, I think with Boys in Heat, I think Neil Kernan had uh, he got you an amazing drum sound on that record. It was great. I mean, for the time, um, yeah, uh, dude, you listen to any '80s record. I, I was thinking about this the other night, like just going back listening to stuff. Yeah, even the first Britney record. Who was it? John Jensen. Jensen, yeah. Jensen. He yeah. had you had a nice sound on that record too. Yeah, it was way, I think, way more natural. I think Neil was pushing the, you know, he was kind of, at that time, people were starting to use samples and things like that, or at least enhancing mm -hmm. the sounds with something else, you know, and uh, some effects and stuff. But it's funny because that record was almost, you know, in contrast to the first, a little bit overproduced, even in the drum sound area. And I remember I did a, my first um, interview for Modern, Modern Drummer magazine, and the girl that interviewed me, the first thing she asked was like, are the drums sampled, you know? Or is this like an electronic thing? And I mean, it really does sound so much different and so much more, um, you know, electronic. It's a, it's a good, punchy heavy sound but it's still way different than like a you know like an organic analog sound so um yeah it was weird because people were trying to you know basically if you were to compare it to say like uh uh hysteria or something you know pyromania where they you know they really work the drums on mm. the you know on the digital side big time but uh so I guess, you know, that was also the trend at the time. Uh, you had to really have that kind of sound to to keep up with everything that was going on. But I think Kern nailed it. Whoever, I don't know how much he produced 
before, and I know I think he did the Heaven's Edge record too. Uh, yeah, he did, yeah. But before, I mean, we, you know, our, he came into our radar from a lot of stuff that we dug anyway. He did like um, Doc and uh, Under Lock and Key. He did Queensrÿche Rage for Order, which sounds fucking amazing so a lot of the stuff that he had done we were like fans of so we thought well this will make us sound even better you know but it depends on the band it depends on the songs you know whatever situation is going on at the time I think but for the songs and and the sound of that record i mean i remember hearing it the first time going, holy fuck man this thing sounds huge you yeah know? it had some it had a lot of to it. balls to it, man. I think. Yeah. Well, the first Cinderella was what? Uh, drum machine, right? That's always been. Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, that was, uh, they just had a studio, I mean, a, a session name? guy. Gary? Come in and, um, Jody Cortez played on Jody. the first album. Really? He was, yeah. I've always Gary, heard Gary that was a drum the, machine. Yeah, Gary oh, no. Benedetta played guitar on that record. Barry played a few solos. Yeah, um, maybe some rhythm stuff, but uh, yeah, they were kind of in between, you know, drummers at the time. I mean, uh, Jim I never Bernick, that, like hearing it from Mike, you know, hearing his side of everything of what happened back then. It's like they they got Tom, they signed Tom, and I guess Eric. Why yeah. not just have the two guys that were you played with the last two years record the record with you you know it back and forth they know it back and forth right I, mean, I, I don't know if that i think i asked mike if he was ever to offer that and he said no but it's just like you're going to bring outside players to play on something they're not you know that they have to learn really you know what i mean yeah 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 it makes a lot of sense but i never also... understood like just use the dudes that were there for the past three years playing yeah I mean, I'm before sure they that. get. They were with I'm Priscilla sure. Harriet before that, the three of them. Right. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I don't know if, yeah, if you're talking about Mike and Tony specifically, I mean, I don't That's know weird. if it was necessarily uh, a playing standpoint or if it was more of a, an age and a look. It was, I think thing. it was more of an age and a look why they were asked to kind of be. Like, yeah, I mean, because, you know, Mike's great and he yeah. can play anything and he always shown in the studio, you know, with his soloing and his rhythm parts. I mean, the guy, you know, there's no doubt that that dude could have done what needed to be done. So I don't think they even got a chance to no. go in and do that, you know, that stuff. I mean, no, uh, they were just going for a look and an image and um you know and sometimes that shit can come down and happen so quick that you don't even know you know i mean it's like oh you fight all your life to get to that point where you get signed and then the you know whoever it is the you know says well you know we want to sign the band but we don't want these two guys you know what are they going to do you know they're going to fucking say no we don't want to deal on polygram or, or right. sorry dudes you know what i mean so it's it's shitty but it also is like it's happened billions of times yeah, some right. bands you know make a record and stay together but they never even play on the record you know some bands yeah. that actually will keep their lineup intact may not be you know i mean look at i mean a kiss at some point and uh so many others that 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 scenarios is happened to so it's, it's crazy. Uh, when I was, that's where i first met mike when i was a kid he used to work at the listening booth at king of prussia mall yeah and i remember like he in like 86 87 He's he's in there working, selling the Cinderella record to people. How fuck, you know? Mm. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Said, that, that was the worst that fucking suck. thing. Like, somebody comes up to the counter with the new Cinderella, the first album, and he's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, fuck, man. Man, I even heard rumors that they uh, approached Shannon from Ratchild, Shannon Larkin, to help out on that first album. That's what know. I've heard that before too. But I've always heard it was a drum machine. That's crazy to find out. It yeah. Was. Nah, yeah. I knew that. Yeah. Yeah. They even on the second record went through, you know, 
a laundry list of players. And so did Fred ever play on any Cinderella records? Yeah, he did Heartbreak Station, which is okay. killer. And uh, you know, yeah. that just shows you that he probably, you know, could have and even did I mean there's so many stories of guys that, you know, there's legendary stories from Steely Dan, for example, who have, you know, wiped tracks from some of the best <laughs> who's that dude this is my, this is my my one of my best friends on the planet oh cool <laughs> yeah dude let's do it over uh over this network here yeah, he's, like, <laughs> he's, Michael, dude, he's fucking awesome he's a great drummer too yeah uh, right on all right mike one of these days <laughs> yeah gotta, but we just got, we just gotta to get finish back that and- back to the states to the, for a visit first yeah <laughs> not, I, I don't know we're not allowed to go to germany i know that right yeah if i, I come how- over if i come over there i'd have to uh, when i return get tested immediately and do like a 14 day self quarantine thing where yeah. over here or back when you go back to germany when i get here yeah which yeah. would suck because you know and uh that sucks man yeah, it's just all fucked up. But just to finish that last thing, um, so many drummers, even great ones, have been sort of pushed aside to, um, you know, for other guys to come in and, and finish a track or whatever. Like, I mean, it's just really comes down to what what the producer wants and what the, you know, the head of the band, if there is one, is going for, you know, so... Um, luckily, you know, I've never been in that position and that's, uh, that's gotta be a pretty big mind fuck for, you know, to be in a huge band and then to have not even be able to play on your record, you know, it's really tough, but Fred's awesome, man. He's a killer drummer. And I think that whole situation really just made him, you know, made him better, you know, because he did a lot of work to get back to the point where, you know, he could do it. And, uh, and yeah, he's, he's, he's a good dude. Yeah. I always thought it was strange. Like when the albums would come out, it's, you'd read it and see additional musicians and like long cold winter, especially it's like, where the fuck was Fred? Like, was he hurt? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sick. But didn't cozy, cozy pal had done some stuff with Tom, I think, but I don't know if that ever really made it onto the, Long yeah, cold. there's some, you know, you can tell if you listen to Long Cold Winter, you can tell which tunes, like, I think, uh, uh, man, I mean, the heavy bluesy stuff, of course, I think the last mile is cozy and, um, wow. just, yeah, wow. but uh, yeah, they, I think it was, I don't know if it was all him, now I can't remember if it was Denny Carmasi or, I think it was Denny and yeah, Cozy yeah. and... Um, I just assumed yeah. it was Danny on the whole record back then. You no, know? nah, you can hear a little bit of a difference. The heavier, you know, Long Cold Winter, that yeah, song was definitely uh, cozy and stuff cool. like that. But uh, even Cozy even played on some Doro, on what was said to be Warlock, the Triumph and Agony album. Uh, cozy Pal did like four or five tracks on that record. And uh, yeah. That's Remember so- the night uh, Cinderella? Uh, headline the spectrum here for that long cold winter. Yeah, right when the album came out. I, yeah, I think it was right at holidays. And the, the reason I met John is my other, one of my other brothers, Rob, is Johnny's one of John's best friends too. So Rob and I got close, hanging out at the mall of all places, <laughs> buying music. All right, and me and John met. Yeah. So, um, I was telling. I forget where I was going with this. What was I saying before that? Cinderella at the Spectrum. Oh, yeah. So we're me and Rob, you were there, and I went to my seat on the floor. And next thing I know, we're at the end of the show, and John's out. You're playing cowbell with Fred at the at? <laughs> I know? don't remember that. But no, you came uh, up. You were, you were playing cowbell. They were doing Jumping Jack Flash. Okay, cool. It was like their yeah. big headline hometown gig. Yeah, man. That's cool. Tommy was or Tom was at the 
top of the spectrum on that white piano during oh, yeah. one of that the battles. Cool, they dropped them down. You know, like, mm-hmm. I was like, holy fuck, I guess these guys really did make it, man. <laughs> yeah, they did you know? great, man. But it's funny I I how... Go ahead. Go, uh, no, it's, I was just thinking about all those things that just have happened to me that kind of all mash up into a a smoothie of brain matter, you know, it's hard <laughs> to fucking remember shit sometimes. Definitely. That was so funny because I was on the floor and I was like, I just looked up and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Rob's, I, I, don't, I don't know if Rob was standing next to me or not. No, Rob was with you, I think. All right. Yeah, I was probably like, hold on, I got to split for a sec. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I was on the floor oh, and up, and John's up there hitting the cowbell doing jumping jack flash and I think one of the, one or two of the guys from Heaven's Edge might have been on on there with you. I can't hmm. remember that, but now I only got to see them once, and that was uh, the first tour they were opening for uh, David Lee Roth. Uh, David Lee Roth, yeah. Uh, yeah, they were great. I mean, yeah, yeah, they had some good oh, tours. And... Yeah. Well, Johnny, uh, yeah, George told me you were coming on. It was like, you know, I knew the Britney Fox kind of era but it's like i kind of looked online just see what else you've done and holy shit i didn't know some of the other stuff you had done yeah like i Had pulled this out travel oh whoa yeah man yeah the apocalypse can... they spelled yeah. the wrong spelled the name wrong yeah <laughs> hence the d you know i had to go to <laughs> d-e-e because that's easier to spell but I can't remember. Was it DE on the Wasted Rec? It wasn't on the Wasted No, record. it was D. No. Teodoro. Right. You know, they wanted me to yeah. use my full name. There it is. Yeah, that's it. I had no idea you were on these two albums, man. That's killer. Yeah, dude. And this is kind of cool. timely. We just love Right. It. Yeah, I know. I know. Paul what? Chapman a few months ago and now Pete Way yesterday. And that's really sad, man, that those guys – are gone so soon um you know that was my introduction into the music business i mean those two guys basically showed me the ropes gave me a chance and uh to to be in a band with two guys that you know from from ufo for me which i was a huge fan of before and i'd seen them a million times on these big stages and then to to be in a band with them and then to be friends with them and to be rocking like the biggest crowds I ever played in front of with these two guys was a, you know, Christ, I was like 22 at that time. And that was just a mind blower, but it was, I learned so much from Pete, especially man, just a great fucking showman and uh, super nice guy. And uh, you know, the ultimate rock star, you got to have some stories on that guy. Not oh, asking yeah. to tell any, but I can only yeah. imagine. <laughs> I know, dude. Got to get the book. Got to get the book written, man. <laughs> John, who lived around here from that? Was it Pete that lived around here? Uh, no, um, Pete. Well, I know. I think he lived in in somewhere in Ohio for a while, but way back. I don't know if you're thinking. Are you thinking other people that were in Wasted or? Yeah, because I think I met, I mean, I had a run in, well, I was with, we were with you, I think, and I, you, I, I met Pete Way f- from you, but it was. Were you at part, that gig? Uh, no, it was after, it was after you were in, I mean, it was during the Britney stuff. Okay, because I did catch them, you know, when UFO got back together and stuff, I went and saw Pete. At Sellersville? Uh, at uh, somewhere in Allentown, I don't know if it was Croc oh, Rock or some, somewhere up there, and uh, yeah, a couple times I had popped in on him and stuff like that. But yeah. I don't know who you're who you're thinking of, if unless it was like Ronnie Kayfield or somebody like that who was in Wasted in the very beginning. Uh, He's another Philly guy. Barry Benedetta was in there for a little no, that's bit. Ronnie, Ronnie Kayfield. Yeah, I knew somebody was local, but. I can't remember yeah. how I'm. I, it had to be at Allentown that I just shook hands with Pete Way. It wasn't like a hangout thing. It was like, "Hey, man, how you doing? Nice to meet you," kind of thing. Mm. But it was yeah. like, how did you get that gig? I mean, what led to the uh, uh Basically, my 
one of my best friends, Jimmy Delella, is a, a keyboard player, a guitarist. Um, he's a real talented dude and just one of my best friends from back in the time. We were hanging out a lot uh, during, um, it was around 84, 85. And uh, I was buying Kerrang! Mag magazine pretty religiously up at Record Revolution in, uh, in Valley Forge. Really? PA. Uh, and it would come yeah. out like twice a month or something like that. So I was always in there buying music and buying that magazine and just checking out what was going on. So I bought, I bought the magazine. I took it home. I started reading it and in the front where the news section was, there was a story or just a blurb that said Paul Chapman from UFO was now living in Florida and had started basically a solo band and um, was looking for players and looking for like a utility guy to play keys and rhythm guitar. And I was like, so I, you know, went to Jimmy's place and I was like, dude, this is you, man. They're like, they're looking for you, you know, the Paul Raymond, uh, mm -hmm. Neil Carter type mold, you know, Jimmy played guitar and keys, like I said. And uh, so, you know, we just went on this sort of, you know, thing to try to get in touch with Paul. There was no email, you know, um, he may have left the phone number and an address, send a package, you know, snail mail. It was like this process took like probably a week to even get in touch with the guy. So um, he sent a package down. Paul was impressed by it called him one day and was like, fucking Paul Chapman, you know, Jimmy's dad's like, uh, there's a Paul Chapman on the floor. Like, what? You're like you yeah. know, okay, like, this is insane. So basically Paul, you know, said, sounds great. You know, I want you to come down. So Jimmy packed up like a U-Haul and went down to Florida, started playing with him, you know, thinking like, man, this is it. My big break, you know, and next, you know, a week later, he's eating fucking ramen noodles and like calling home for like, you know, his dad to send him some loot and stuff because there's like no money. You know, <laughs> I'm playing with a fucking rock star and there's no money and there's nothing happening except music, you know. So he's like, I'm just going to fucking do it and, you know, see what happens. So uh, to kind of shorten the story, basically they tried to get a deal and nothing was really happening. So Paul thought, you know, I'll just go back to England where I basically am more well known and no more connections there. And as he was going to England with his demos in hand, he runs into, you know, nobody but Pete way. And Pete's like, Oh, Paul, I need a fucking guitar player. We've got like a maiden tour coming up and this and that. And, and Paul was like, um, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, you know. And so they just, Paul stayed in England and started to, to play with Wasted and then uh, proceeded to call Jimmy up to join Wasted like a, a little while later. And then so here I have a, a, a best friend who's now in a band featuring two guys from UFO and making records in England and he's going over there and doing TV shows and gigs and stuff. And I was just like, this is amazing. You know, I was really cheering him on, but secretly like, fuck man, I wish, you know, something like that could happen for the rest of us, you know? Mm -hmm. And eventually it did when they um, were looking for a drummer, Jerry Shirley was in the band at the time and they had just finished a record and he didn't want to tour anymore so they started thinking about you know a replacement and jimmy mentioned my name and said i know the guy you know and paul i think trusted him really a lot and pete was like okay you know let's check him out so i went over there um and it was not like an open audition with 50 guys i mean it was literally like you're the dude if you can you know if you can hang, you got the gig. And luckily I went in and played, we jammed and, uh, yeah. And they were like, cool, let's do it. And I was just like blown away because now I'm in, in England playing with these guys and UFO. You know, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It was amazing shit. Now, how long were you with them? Just the one album and yeah, one album. Uh, but, and a tour it was about two and a half years, the whole process, you know, yeah, but unfortunately, 
Do yeah, at the end first? of it. What's that? Can you go out and play live with them first before you guys did the record or no? We did um, – I think we did some warm up shows, you know. We went and uh like the Marquee over sea over in England. Yeah, my first gig was at the Marquee in London. It was That's basically right. a showcase for they had already kind of, you know, worked out the deal with uh with EMI, but they basically wanted to see the band live. So they kind of booked this like private gig. Or it wasn't private, I mean it was sold out, but it was a very like limited thing. So yeah. Um, yeah, we played that gig. That was my first gig, my introduction. And, uh, at the end of it, Bruce Dickinson and Steve Harris came up and played like too hot to handle and a couple of UFO songs. Fuck. And, uh, you know, then my picture was in Kerrang, the fucking magazine that I was just reading like a couple months ago as a little fan dude. And, uh, yeah. And that's just kind of how it all started. Your head had to just be exploding at that point, man. That had to be great. It was it, 20, 22 years old. Yeah, yeah. you don't really – I mean, it's it's weird, but, you know, you kind of like just – you're blown away, but at the same time you don't want to look like a total douchebag. So you right. kind of like have to keep mm -hmm. your cool and, you know, try to fit in and not look like you're just like walked in off the uh, the rehearsal room, you know, or out of your basement the day before. So obviously they saw something and, you know, I felt a connection because, you know, being a fan and it wasn't, it was like a friendly recommendation and it wasn't like a, an open call. I mean, if I would have had to audition against 50 or a hundred other drummers, I probably would have never gotten the gig. Cause it's just not my kind of, I've never been that kind of uh, player or, you know, to search out those kinds of things. I've always really been more into, you know, a sort of organic band feeling, you know what I mean? And mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it, it was very lucky, but it was also, um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. So from there it was on into Britney, and then from Britney was into Dora, right? Yeah, yeah. So how did how did the? You know, I did find something online I'd never seen before or heard, uh, mm -hmm. and, but I was able to find it on YouTube. It was a band called Mariah? Is that right? Yeah, Mariah was a, a band from Minneapolis, and they were again another Jimmy Delella. Uh, hook up for me and it's funny because the the Britney thing came right at the tail of the wasted era coming to a close I mean they had had they had fired Paul Chapman and then there was this kind of whole thing like what's going to happen now are we going to lose the deal or are we going to even get a good guitar player to replace how do you replace a guy a legend like that you know yeah and so when I kind of put weighed all the options and then got a call from like Michael Kelly Smith or something saying that they wanted me to come back to Philly and join Britney. It was like a no brainer for me. So I kind of jumped from the sinking ship into the other boat, you know, and, uh, did, you know, the Britney thing worked out perfectly for me. And it was kind of the same ending of Britney like around 92 when we pretty much were like just grasping at whatever straws we could with a new singer and t touring club gigs around the States and things were just not really going very far at that time. So um, Mariah had an opportunity to, um, they were writing songs with Richie and John from Bon Jovi and he was supposed to, um, you know, work with them, get them a deal, you know, do like a production thing with them. They were writing songs together. So it looked like they were going to be his next sort of skid row project, you know? Mm -hmm. And so Jimmy was talking me up on them and, you know, to, to come and, and get in there and uh, cause they wanted to have a drummer change. And so it was the same situation. I went to Minneapolis right out of like a Britney club tour when we decided we were going to take a break and I went up there and, and did like their farewell show. They were going to move to Jersey and uh, work with Steve Brown from Trickster and their management and stuff like that. Cause the Bon Jovi thing fell through. So 
it was a, a hopeful situation, a band with some really good songs, but I think a little bit too, um, too AOR sounding for that time. I mean, this is 92, 93. That's what I was getting ready to say. I listened to it last night on YouTube and it was yeah. like, wow, you know, it's, it's really killer AOR, yeah. but like, yeah. you know, it's a little late, but the, yeah. vocal, the dude singing, fantastic yeah. voice and yeah, all that. great voice and uh good uh, writers I, and i'd never even heard of that yeah. they have two or one or two records out before like independent things before that one you were on right uh all that stuff came out sort of after the fact you uh, know what i mean they kind of uh some label you know finally grabbed a bunch of their stuff and put it out but i don't know if they had released anything independently God. they may have but uh yeah, so that uh, didn't really last that long. It kind of all went to went to shit because of the just the timing of it, and during the whole grunge era, that was like probably the least, you know. Yeah. Uh, if it had been like eighty seven, yeah, eighty yeah. seven, yeah, eighty seven would have been like right on the borderline, kind of like Britney was. You know, we got a couple years out of it, and uh, but yeah. So next up is Doro, and I, I do have this was the yeah. first, right? Yeah. That's the live yeah. album. Yeah, that's my first. You miss, uh, you miss one, one. I well, a cop, not a cop, but the Ghost Dance Tribe record. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah. that's not a very well known one, but that was fun. And you, you did. played on the whole, not the whole thing, like half of it or something. Uh, I did, yeah, six songs or something yeah. like that. You that was, your cage. What a fucking great song. Yeah. Man. Yeah. yeah what was man. this? Ghost Dance Tribe was this project put together by a local guy, uh, Bill Graham. Yeah, Bill, a Native American dude, right? Well, supposedly, Spark. yeah. Right. <laughs> he looks like it. Yeah. And uh, it was, I think, right around Bite Down Hard around that era. We were in Sea Isle City working on demos and yeah. working Tommy Parrots in. And we were living in a house which had a studio upstairs and, uh, Bill Graham was also living there. And um, so we were um, sort of all kind of hanging out in there together. He was trying to finish up his project and we were working on our demos. And uh, so in between when we were in the studio, he asked if I could play some drums on his stuff. So we all jumped in on some tunes of his and uh, that was a great CD that never really saw the yeah. light of day. So many projects it just kind of like fizzle man for whatever reasons but um any idea where billy is he's in california is i he? saw him on one doro tour he came to i think it was one of the last gigs at the house of blues we played in in hollywood and billy came and he was like in and out of these rooms and crazier than ever and i caught up with him for a little while but uh and then it was like as quick as he was there, he was gone and it was like, holy shit, man. But I know he's on Facebook. He's oh, cool. Uh, yeah. He's on there somewhere. See him pop up every now and then. Yeah, so cool. Yeah. There was some good shit on there. It was kind of, you know, not as uh, dark and, and disturbed as like Marilyn Manson, but he's that kind of character. You know what I mean? Guy has like some great concepts and some great, ideas and he was doing some wicked shit on stage i mean we took him out to do some uh we did a little run on the east coast with britney when tommy joined to kind of you know work him in and warm him up to things and we took billy and ghost dance tribe out to open up for us and he was you know he would come out full on on a crucifix <laughs> You know, like just doing crazy shit. And we just happened to be playing in the Bible Belt when he decided to uh, whip that show out. So <laughs> it was like, you know, one one show and then, you know, they had the authorities alerted already and shit. So oh, it was shit. like this guy, you know, <laughs> it's not going to be uh, very good for us to have him, you know, on the rest of the tour. But a good time anyway. But uh that's yeah. Great. So the Doro Live was my first record with Doro and basically recorded about a week into me being in the band. 
Um, and again, this is ridiculous, but Jimmy Delella also got me. The only gig he didn't get me was the Britney gig, but he got me <laughs> into Doro because he um, he had been playing with her for a few months before that when she came down from uh, New York. She was living in Manhattan at the time and uh, auditioned some players. And Nick Douglas, who's from Blackwood, New Jersey, uh, got the gig on bass. And they did some touring with other people. And then uh, after that record, they came down to Philly and Jersey to kind of check out other players and to do some, you know, writing and stuff like that. So they uh, auditioned. And at that point, the band was Nick Douglas, uh, Chris Branco from Black Eyed Susan was playing drums, uh, Joe Taylor who did some time with us in Doro about 15 years we played together. He's from uh, upper, you know, middle Jersey or North Jersey. Um, and uh, Jimmy, Strider, man. yeah, Joe's awesome, man. Uh, Jimmy DeLello on keys and guitar again. So um, they went to Germany, did some gigs, a couple TV shows and whatnot. And then uh, Chris, felt that he wasn't really into touring over there and staying away from home for too long. So old Jim gives me a call and tells Doro, you know, I know the guy it's Johnny D from Brittany Fox. And she's like, Oh, I know that band. You know, I love that song save the week or one of those. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Let's check him out. So, you know, again, I got to just walk in and play and basically get hired on the strength of a recommendation and I hope hopefully some of my playing came into, uh, Shit, into that sure. decision. See, but how many years you've been with her now? 27. I would say she likes your play. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. John was always like Phil Rudd, man. You could set your watch to John, the way he played. It was, it's crazy. Like, yeah. I mean, him and Bill, you and Bill as the rhythm section of Brittany. I don't think there was any better rhythm section in that style of music then. Mm, I cool, think. man. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, with Bill, we shit, we played. You know, Billy was one of the first real musicians that I ever played with in my parents' basement. So we just had a thing, you know. And yeah, yeah it was pretty cool to to be, you know, bonded with somebody like that for such a long time. Which now Nick and I have for 27 years i mean the dude's like glue man he's like velcro you know we're two sides of the velcro thing that just kind of like stick together man which is awesome he's a great player too man yeah. love that dude now you yeah, so that, go ahead as i say you mentioned like uh playing with wasted when the guys from maiden come up and all that you got 27 years with doro you've had to have met all the metal guys pretty much. Oh man, dude, especially in Europe, you know, to be, um, you know, I mean, we've toured with motorhead. We've toured with, you know, done gigs with the scorpions with, we play with Saxon, like religiously, we've done some, so many shows with them. They're, they're like our brothers now. And, uh, yeah, so many more, um, and a lot of the newer bands too, you know, she's friends with a lot of the newer, uh, metal bands like Amona Marth and, um, you know, Ham uh, Hammerfall and, uh, just, you know, the list goes on, but, uh, to be around Europe and doing all the festivals and stuff like that, you really get to get a big thrill out of meeting some, some cool ass people. I bet. Yeah. Priest. I mean, you know got to meet those guys a bunch of times and i met priest because because yeah, you i was with you and rob we went pre, uh no halford and maiden was it just halford opening yeah down yeah the jersey thing okay yeah i would have never met him if i wasn't with you that night yeah it's funny man that's we just like you know to me it's just like another gig and you know if you have a couple friends with you it's like for me, it would be like no big deal or, but you know, um, sometimes you, you know, get lucky enough to bring a friend or something and make their fucking year, you know? And I always <laughs> like that. That was the second, no, the second time. The first time was the, 
we were at rock uh, that rock and roll what the fuck operation rock and roll with priest not priest motorhead alice cooper was uh was Dio Angel. on that huh no not dio who else was on that i don't to- know like I said, man, smoothie brain. It's, it's not, <laughs> it all really. runs together after a while, man. Oh, it was Judas Priest. Yeah, it was Priest. Okay. Yeah. And that's the first time I met Halford that night. And it was you, Rob, and I, and Larry from Record Rev. Larry was the one that got us down there. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Wow. I haven't, man, saw that dude in forever. Somebody in the comments said, what a great story, but I don't know. Uh, no, your wasted of... story, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, Pete Way. Cool. Thanks, man. <laughs> yeah, you remember before we that. uh not that we're close, but before we wrap this up, try and think of a nice, fun, positive Pete Way story you could tell us. <laughs> Isn't okay. <too> crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pete, I, I couldn't uh, imagine. Point, I don't well, Pete was pretty sober at that point, right? When I played with him, man, he was in some the best shape of his life, <laughs> I think. He, he cleaned up for kind of Pretty well. Cleaned up, and I think this, you know. Whoa, look out! <laughs> um, yeah, it was a big deal when he got that record, and he had a lot riding on it. I mean, Steve Harris went to bat for for him. You know, I want to say for us, but it was for him. It was for his fucking hero, Pete Way. I mean, you know, he wore those striped trousers because of Pete, and you know, Pete was such a big influence on so many bass players and uh and also one of the kindest people you'd ever meet you know he would do cool shit and he was just really uh took steve harris under his wing early on and you know and and steve wanted to repay him i think and and helped him get the deal with emi and made sure that we were doing you know, what we could to, to make the best of it. So Pete was, you know, off the stuff and he was running every day. And I never even knew, I knew he ran like hell back then, but I didn't know he like ran track and shit until I read his book. I mean, I spent that time with him and never even realized that he was a runner before he was a rock star, you know, but uh, yeah, I mean. So your time around him, wasn't the madman time well it, it, more, it's more focused believe me like like i won't say anybody was sober at that time i mean but they knew when business needed to get done and when it was time to just and when it was time to let shit go that was like fucking you know these guys were professionals man i mean i you know i didn't know how to drink or do anything until i was in that band it was like <laughs> holy shit you know but uh you know, there was, deep end. <laughs> there was some, some legendary shit going down to try and hang with those dudes. So, um, yeah, we had some fun. But, uh, yeah, I was going to say when by the time we did Europe and, you know, drinking here and there and getting a little crazy. And as time sort of went on uh, and we got to America, it was like, holy shit, you know, these old dealers start showing up. You know, knocking on the bus door. Hey, where's Pete? And it's like, oh fuck, you know, who's this guy? And he's like, you know, laying out some fucking Peruvian marching powder and all kinds of shit. And then it just got crazy after that. So I don't know how long it would have gone on before something bad happened. You know, luckily uh, that didn't happen at that time. Wow, <laughs> that's nuts. So what was, uh, you said you played some shows with Motorhead. Yeah. I mean, well, of course you got to ask you know, what Lemmy was like. Oh, uh, Lemmy was, was Lemmy. I mean, you can't, you know, one of a kind. Um, <laughs> just, for example, another super nice guy. I mean, you could just basically walk up, stand next to him, and if he was not busy, would have, like, any kind of conversation as you would with any other dude standing next to you in a club or whatever. And he was, you know, just such a great attitude and such a, you know, a funny dude. And, uh, you know, he had his routine, man. He would come in the venue early. He had a slot machine 
uh, in his dressing room and he would just, <laughs> you know, Jack and Cokes sit there, pull the, you know, pull the lever for a couple hours and do whatever he had to do and hit wow. the stage and just fucking kill it every night. And, uh, yeah. And even Mickey and, and Phil super cool dudes and they were, you know, just great to tour with. I mean, it was, it was fucking amazing you, to watch them every night and to, to learn from that. And, uh, yeah, it was cool. Not the easiest band to open a show for, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah, we did a good job and, and had no adverse reactions. So it was always <laughs> fun. Well, him and, uh, Lemmy and Doro were pretty tight, weren't they? Yeah. Big time. And they had done, they've hung out in the past a lot and they've done a lot of stuff in the studio together. He sang yeah, on man. two or at least three ballads with her on our albums, which yeah. were always a highlight, you know? And uh, yeah, she's, she's pretty much heartbroken over that loss, man. That was a tough one. Yeah. Everybody is. I mean, that's just like losing, you know, such a big, a legendary figure you know yeah so, you know, at this point you know lemmy that icon status dora's got that now i mean she's like yeah. kind of the queen of german metal at least for sure metal. yeah i mean it's, it's crazy sometimes that you know that uh that term gets thrown around at the you know and people might sort of not really be into it or what i mean it's and it's not like she really created it or whatever but i mean literally she's like one of the pioneers of mm -hmm. female vocals you know i mean she's was singing like a fucking banshee you know back when she was like 17 or something like that some of those first records and um you know not just you know, you have your amazing female singers, you know, like Hart and, and Ann Wilson, very bluesy and stuff. But Dora was singing fucking heavy metal, you know, and it was like, yeah, <laughs> she was just ripping it up, too. You know, it was not like a joke, you know, no. uh, and she just looked fucking amazing, too. So it was like, really, she had a lot, you know the best of both worlds going on. But uh, it was a hard, I'm sure, a hard road for her to to plow through all that, you know, testosterone, manly and testosterone yeah. fueled metal. <laughs> but man, wow, the, the longevity, like, man. Yeah. She's I feel still like a lot, of, a lot of the <clears throat> bands and guys that like that kind of music accepted her uh, pretty easy rather than, you know, like yeah, right off the bat with the warlock days, you know yeah. what I mean? It was like burn the witches and all that. It was like, you know, that's not, you know, cheesecake or whatever that's fucking right. metal you know she's badass yeah, i know dude I to always see that you know to i mean to be a dude in a band and then have that kind of come out and open up for you i mean that's gonna fucking whip <laughs> your ass in so many different ways you know you're like yeah, sure. checking her out and you're blown away by her voice and her energy and her connection with the crowd which is still amazing you know to to witness yeah um, it's just the but yeah i mean she's still doing it you know some some have have you know pioneered the way and maybe not doing it anymore or as on such a level you know but she's still st still kicking ass and still loves doing it and still really passionate about it it's it's very inspiring to me too you know yeah, I think, it's, I think it's great. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. I don't keep up as much with newer stuff, but it's great to know she's still out there. You know, you're still yeah. out there with her doing this stuff. It's awesome, man. You know? Yeah, man. It's, uh, well, you know. On that, what, 01 run? Brittany and Doro? Yeah, that was pretty um, wild. Yeah. Cool, like, sitting on the bus just shooting the shit with her. It was like, yeah. Tough. It's just some, well, I always, I always like, uh, Joe, the bass was no. Uh, what's the bass player's name? Nick. Nick. Yeah. I always thought talking to him was interesting too. Like he knows his shit. Like as far as uh, music stuff goes, 
And yeah, he's sitting talking with him, and then she sits down and jumps right into the conversation. It's like, holy fuck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like a chick knows her shit, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, she's one of the guys at times, you know, yeah. she's got those kinds of um, sort of qualities where she, you know, she's one of the boys, you know, when, when she needs to be and she can be like the sweetest thing, you know, or just like punch you in the throat or <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, or sing a ballad that will make you cry. I mean, I've seen people cry in the crowd when we do a song for Immer, for example, which is all in German, but you know, people have gotten married to this song and, uh, and whatever emotions that are coming out at a metal show, you know, that's why, because, you know, queen of metal. Yeah. But I mean, she's got so much more yeah, uh, scope than that. Sometimes I think that, you know, that kind of name hangs her up in a certain category, but man, she's got just, you know, such a, such a, a variety of, of things that she can do. And um, I like playing the ballads, you know, just as much as the rock songs, because it's just, you see, I get a chance to slow down and actually see what's going on out in the crowd. And uh, it's mm -hmm. a pretty amazing thing to see, to witness, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Now, are you uh, like still actively following music or I know most musicians, it seems like, working musicians once you guys get going you're working on your stuff it's hard to keep up with what else is going on and all that yeah i mean admittedly i'm i'm pretty much out of touch with so much i can't keep that's, up with it you know that's me too and I, yeah i mean and I, <laughs> I just don't give a fuck anymore so. it's weird because every <laughs> once in a while something may pop out and uh, you know it'll kind of appeal to me but i'm not like i don't really actively search it out if i hear something or some somebody recommends something i'll check it out but um yeah. and it's not uh i just really prefer a lot of the older stuff and i can listen to that shit over and over uh, or there's so many things from back in the day that i missed and i kind of exactly. go back and yeah. you know and check out again but uh for me it's you know, there is a lot of, of good stuff. I would never say there's not any good stuff coming out, but it's just the fact that from what I'm used to and the whole way that I was used to um, being introduced to music or where you get your music from, now you pretty much have, you know, anything, anywhere, anytime. And I have, such, like, yeah. I have such ADD that I can't even fucking begin to, like, really, you know, focus right. enough to like okay i gotta get that record or i'm gonna go you know and i probably if i still went to a store and bought music and listened to shit like i we did back in the day some people still do i just that that sort of routine for me fell out somewhere and uh and um yeah but uh like i i can't keep up either but george here he's all the time you know pulling out yeah. really cool ones like damn i need to check that out <laughs> that's good man we need people like george you know i don't know about the, i don't know about that <laughs> oh well, yeah dude i mean you gotta you know <laughs> even back in the day i was always kind of relying on friends to really turn me on to to stuff i had a friend that would basically hit the you know the uh shops in the city you know and I, we're out in the burbs and he's uh, going down to the record stores in the city quite often and coming back with, you know, a lot of imports at that time and stuff. The first time I heard the Blizzard of Oz album was through my friend Steve, and he came back and we dropped a needle on that and just were blown away. And it wasn't even out here yet, you know. It had mm -hmm. just come out in England, and all of a sudden it was like, holy shit, you know, not only Ozzy's new band but it was like what the fuck is going on on the guitar man this guy's fucking sick you know man so, I, I miss that about not to interrupt you but like when we were younger and all of our friends were doing that it, we all had those guys or we yeah. were yeah too when yeah we'd all get together and be like hey have you heard this and it was it was so great to find something and be like 
this is awesome. I can't wait to turn him onto this or, right. or you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like I you don't have that now as you get older, I guess, you know. Yeah, I guess it depends. But somebody says they need you, George. They need, <laughs> need my, you to That's my other brother Steve. <laughs> he needs <That's> you. you. <laughs> See, he needs you to hook him up. <laughs> That's kind of what the VC turned into, the vinyl community that George and I met through. We were all just, you know, showing records, talking about music, and then, you know, everybody's on the hunt for everything then. And it got That's crazy cool, for a man. few years, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were to have that, you know. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, I'd be shopping and I'd be texting Green and like, you have this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we even, we even hooked up a couple times up there. Yeah. Did some shopping. Where was that? He lives in West Virginia. Yeah, I'm about three hours away. So, oh wow! Up. Yeah, we went, we went to a uh, record uh, show. Oh, out yeah. In Easter, yeah. And then we went to a uh, couple shops the next time. I think it's a good time. Yeah. I love doing that. You know, it's like yeah. But as you get older, you don't have, you know, everybody that used to do it doesn't do it anymore. You know. Right. Yeah. I mean, it could be time. It could be kids. It could be yeah, lack of funds you know what i mean the shit it's just expensive life, to know. buy music people are used to getting it for free but yeah um or yeah. My mental health <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i think we're all a bit fucking whacked at this point yeah <laughs> greeno knows my i mean oh john knows too like the last two years have been pretty fucking rough but this yeah past, dude the pandemic's been like it got you um, hard, I think. It got me hard at the beginning. But yeah. once I opened the shop back up, I've been good. So Yeah, I could tell a huge change in you once you got the store going again. Yeah, it sucked, man. Like uh, it sucks because I've been on these same fucking pills for like 15 years. And it's like I had this uh, epiphany one night sitting on the deck. And I'm like, you know, you know, we all get to that like around 50 years old and you start thinking, like, fuck, man. I didn't do anything. I'm 50. I'm fucking, you know. <laughs> you did, though, man. You got a nice family. Yeah, right. You know. It's like you look back at, like, I'm, uh, yeah, I manage a record store now. I'm like, fuck. What the, the fuck. Hey, I'll switch jobs with you, brother. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Any day of the week. <laughs> like I said, this, that kind of business, you got to love what you do or else, yeah. you know, you're not going to make money on it. It's like musicians nowadays. Man. Right. Yeah. yeah. You gotta do it for the love of it. Yeah. But oh shit. I'm I bet Johnny's multi millionaire. Yeah, I'm man. <laughs> yeah. I know it's a whole different deal now. That's like when we were talking about the studio earlier. I was gonna say Def Leopard, when you brought him up, if just the three of us could split all the money they spent on studio time, oh, oh we'd all be retired. Yeah, forget it. <laughs> How much hang, what two and a half years in the studio? After, yeah. after the accident. How many millions do you think they spent in the studio on, you know, just the 80s albums? I'm not 100% sure on timing as far as were they recording that record when he crashed? I don't think so, right? I don't know, man. I can't remember. I don't think they were. But because I think that's what the big deal, the, the, the weight was he wanted to learn how to do it with his feet and yeah. the other arm. And, he, he learned it. I mean, back then it seemed like an eternity between uh, Pyromania and Hysteria. Yeah. Now it's like you blink and four years goes by. You know yeah, I mean? no doubt. It, it seems like yeah. Pyromania, I mean, that was kind of the last big album for me, for them. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it seemed like they were gone so long. Mm. Yeah. And then, you know, the next one comes out. Like you said, George, you know, but it was only what three or four years, I guess. Yeah. Think of that. In that time, they toured for Pyromania. He was in an accident, lost his arm, and then had to retrain basically his whole body to play drums a different. Yeah. Way right. In that short period of time to do that record, I guess. I mean, I don't know exactly what went into recording that record. It seems like yeah. everything back then was more sped up. I mean, bands put out albums a one a year, one every two years. Two a year? Yeah. How about, you know, Yeah. 
and go I, back a little further and there was you know kiss and putting out two a year putting out two a year and all the other bands doing it's the same true. i mean yeah. yeah and like look at when uh cliff died for metallica mm -hmm. what was it like okay new bass player just roll you know yeah like, now it's yeah. me yeah now you're lucky if you get a new album out of a band every five years six years it seems like a lot of the bigger bands and the older yeah the older bands yeah. if they even put I was, out, so. yeah i was kind of using that math to the you know think about pete passing away and i you know i only spent like two and a half years with the guy but it seems like the way years are going by now it seems like i was with that band for 10 fucking years you know and it's like yeah. it's so much was happening at such a you know i don't know but everything just kind of is like you know yeah it, 10 it, times faster now you know we need everything to go so fast we're fucking speeding ourselves up to get to the end of the fucking exactly you know what i mean <laughs> like, well, like why did i fucking want everything so quickly now i'm <laughs> fucking dead you know it seems like everything's faster now but back then it seems like we got more stuff done, more stuff. Oh, absolutely. Like, man. More music and all. Now yeah. it just seems like you blink an eye and it's five years later. Yeah. Know, like nothing's happened. Crazy. <laughs> it's like, really. Four years was an eternity in the 80s. Somebody yeah. said in the chat. That's a joke. Yeah, it was, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Yep. Uh, Zep said uh, he's about to lose his shit again. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what we were talking about there. <laughs> Maybe when George was going down that dark fucking hole. <laughs> yeah. That fuck, fuck that dark hole. Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, shit. Stay in the light, brother. Stay in the light. So you were a kiss kid, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think most people our age were. Yeah. My first real concert uh, on the... Yeah, Destroyer tour oh, right. in Philly and just, yeah, insane amount of my dad's money spent on <laughs> records and magazines and any kind of shit I could get my hands on. But oh, yeah. it actually, it started with my sister's record collection before that. She had a lot of great stuff like, you know, everything from the monkeys to Elton John to Alice Cooper and deep purple and, you know, ELO and all kinds of stuff. So I would just check into that stuff and, uh, you know, listen, read, you know, read the big old covers with lyrics and things and looking at pictures a million times because you never saw the band actually move or speak. You know, yeah. those yeah. days before anybody saw kids like 16 magazine. That was the way right. you found them. <laughs> yeah. Rock scene. Circuit. Right. Cream. <laughs> anybody seen that cream magazine documentary yet? Not yet. Heard yeah. about it. Seen it. Is it um, all? It's uh, I think you can pay per view on their site. It's oh, like okay. nine, 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 nine ninety nine to rent it or something like that. Yeah, I definitely want to so, see. Go check it out. Right I on. watched the uh, the Go Go's one. I was just getting ready night. to say that, man. Yeah, yeah that was pretty that good. Was, uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, and I'm uh, looking forward to the Triumph one that's supposed to come out because the guys that uh, guys that did the Rush one and the Maiden one. Uh, oh, that's, what's his name up in Canada? Sam. Sam. Yeah, yeah they're man. doing the Triumph one, so that should be pretty good. And right I, was, I was a pretty big Triumph fan. Hell yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's funny. You said the go goes. I was just getting ready to say it. Cause that's the last one I've watched. Too. Right. I miss yeah. the, that's the one of the most current ones I've seen, but man, I love those things. They're just, uh, yeah. even though they're depressing as hell. Cause it's like, if you relive the music, uh, you know, business yeah. every time you watch one, but, or read a book, but it's like, it's still, Okay, maybe uh, it's all right. I'm not the only one that got fucked or the only one that you know right. did this or that. And you're like, okay, we're all doing the same fucking shit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I like uh, the, ZZ, the ZZ Top one was really good. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, that was cool. That's the last one I watched. Hmm. I think. Yeah. So yeah, what are sure. you guys listening to these days? I mean, what's in, what's hot in the vinyl world? Uh, George and I have been like bootleg crazy lately. Yeah, we've been doing uh, bootleg vinyl shit. Like, I pulled a couple out. I was going to share. I didn't know what we were end up doing today. You got this one too, didn't you, George? Yeah, I finally picked that up. Dude, this wow. thing sounds awesome. Yeah, that's a great show. Where is that? Japan or is it from somewhere else? No, nah, it's uh, shit. I can't remember now. Detroit, isn't it? Uh, no, it's Germany, uh, 1990. Mm. And then a couple tracks from uh, 87 in Cleveland. Oh, uh, Cleveland, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Pretty cool. But they, there's a company. I don't know if they're really made in Japan or not, but I don't yeah. think so. they made to look like uh, <laughs> Japanese imports. <laughs> right. Did you grab this one yet, George? Yeah, uh, I got that. Yeah. This that thing is the wrong awesome. date on it. Yeah, it should be 79. I mean, you yeah. can go by the the track list. You can tell it's not 82. Yeah. Um, but uh, open with holy help. shit. I mean, this sounds as good as a regular live, legit released album. You know, it's like, that's, there's the, that's one of those UK, like, legitimate bootleg yeah. things that they've been doing for five, six years. I don't know how the fuck they're getting away with it. But. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, for me right now, like new stuff, it's like I don't keep up too much with new stuff. And I'm old enough now. I have most of the old stuff. So these bootlegs are really pushing buttons. You something know what I mean? It's like, yeah. yeah. It's like something new, you know, from the old band. So yeah, picking that's things cool, up. Man. I've been listening to the latest Super Soccer's record. Uh, I popped the, new Wild, the latest Wild Hearts record on again. I've been listening to that, too. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, the newest shit that I probably listened to was Ghost, which is not even new, but it's kind of like when old dudes say that, you know, the, their favorite new band is the Foo Fighters or something. I mean, it's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, old man. Yeah, keep talking. But I that did. The first Ghost album's cool. I really dug it. Yeah, I yeah. thought cool. It's, uh, it's kind of thrilling just because of the you know, the mystique about it. And it's a little bit, you know, kind of like the feel of the kiss thing back in the day. Yeah. And, the, uh, I heard a little like BOC in it too. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, of like, course. Just, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, not what you really imagine when you, you know, when you see the image in the, mm -hmm. and the stuff and then you hear the music, it's very, especially the last record, man, super, super commercial, catchy sounding, but with some darker, you know, imagery, which is pretty cool, but right. uh, there's a whole, it's kind of maybe towards the end of it now, but over the last seven, eight, maybe 10 years, there was a whole like retro movement. They were calling it the new wave of traditional heavy metal, which you may be familiar with some of the bands like Enforcer and, you know, uh, yeah. Going for like the maiden priest type sound and stuff like that. Right. Like yeah. striker, there's a there's a ton of them. And of right, I can't right. look them out right now. Thinking, yeah, but uh, that was really interesting. You know, I was keeping up with a lot of those bands there for a while. You know, yeah, there's a lot of um, I noticed a lot of kind of retro stuff from Sweden. A lot of bands are doing like yeah. the older Sabbath kind of sound and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, like band Lucifer. You yeah, with them at all. Yeah, which is pretty cool. Female singer and uh, very, you know, sort now, of. Uh, Nick from the helicopters is in that now, right? right. Yeah. They married. I think they got married, right? Yep. So that's cool. Yeah. But yeah, she's. But, I dig them. Yeah, cool. Yeah, right He's there, George. Geo doing there. He's all <laughs> muted up. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> You got gas or what? You mute, <laughs> yeah, muting your mic. I was gonna say it's just good thing this isn't smell of vision, man, because I'm like I'm like really hurting today. <laughs> We're having a heat wave here with no AC, man. It's, it's oh no good shit. times. Uh, yeah, it's funny. been hot as shit here too. I'm sure up there with you too, George. Today wasn't too bad. Yeah. Like yeah. the last three weeks before this, holy crap, we've been in the I don't mix that. 
I don't miss that East Coast soup, man. That uh, shit. Like <laughs> brutal. brutal. It's like get from one air conditioned area to the next. That's the yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Fuck this, man. Yeah. We got a little damn window AC at the shop. That thing does not work. No. No. Is that all you got in the shop? Yeah, man. Holy shit. <laughs> I'll wait till winter to visit. <laughs> yeah, then you, you have to keep your coat on then. That's fine. I like the cold. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, we've been an hour and a half, man. Holy crap. It just goes yeah, by. That was quick. Yeah. So anything else you want to touch on, George? Or John, nah, man. Yeah. Yeah. I like the... Uh, nah. What the hell was that? No, nah, I'm good. Right on. Well, this has been awesome, man. It was cool. Very right. cool talking to you and getting to meet you. Yeah, you too, man. Thanks for having me on. If you guys, hopefully, you know, yeah, hopefully have you think of there. anything, hit me up or you know, nah, we'll do it again. Have you on again, because we usually liked at the end of last uh, the well, I call it a season one because I had a bout with some depression and Greeno had some health thing going on, so we didn't. Do it for like what three or four months, yeah. Okay, something like that. So, but yeah, it would definitely. Uh, I want to have you back on too. Yeah, cool, man. The last episode uh, we did right before we shut down for a while, we had what six of us on here. And it was yeah, just, uh, now we can get ten. Fun. Yeah, <laughs> so maybe we can get you on with a bunch of other people, man. Just have a good time. Yeah, man, let's do it. Hell yeah! Well, cool. thanks a lot. This has been great. Hang on, cool. don't uh, don't go out yet. Okay. Thank you guys and thanks for who whoever's out there checking it out. Yeah. I'll see, we'll see y'all next time.